there's going to be a, a sort of sub-theme tonight, and I, I'm entering Bear Studies, as you will see. Uh, it's not a, a field that has ever been explored before, but, but I will be opening it up. So to summarise yesterday's lecture, how long have immigrants been labelled illegal? And to reappropriate Martin Luther King's words in Montgomery, Alabama, how long, not long? But the prehistory, as we saw yesterday, was extensive and complicated. So I want to start tonight's lecture in New York Harbour, shortly after New, York, New Year's Day in 1890. The story is taken from the New York Times and was headed Undesirable Immigrants. What is unusual is the type of immigrants involved. These were two performing bears, given the names Gary Baldy and Victor Emmanuel, and they had travelled, you know, good names, and they had travelled with their four Italian owners and arrived in New York on board the Lake Huron, which you see there, um, from Piedmont via Liverpool and Boston. The other picture, and you tell which is the bear and which is not, is from uh, Sheffield Botanical Gardens, uh, where there was one of the few surviving bear pits in, in England and was used in the <coughs> first half of the 19th century for sort of bear baiting and, and performances. So um, the movement of bears internally and externally was, was actually reasonably extensive and, and very unfortunate. The four owners of the of um, Gary Baldy and Victor Emmanuel were not permitted, in the words of the New York Times, to become American citizens, and they escaped from the ship and disappeared in Boston, leaving the two bears behind. The collector um, at Boston refused to, um, the two bears' permission to land, and this then became the problem for his colleague in the port of New York. Um, it was not clear whether the bears would be returned to Europe or landed, as it was claimed, as unclaimed merchandise and sold at auction. So I'll have to follow that one up. Zooming forward to the 21st century, the slogan, no one is illegal, has been taken up by pro-migrant groups, especially those campaigning on behalf of asylum seekers. It is used to highlight the common humanity of those placed beyond the law with regard to their national status. In this respect, uh, the children's character Paddington Bear, who came to England as a stowaway on board a ship from darkest Peru, has become, I quote, amongst immigration lawyers, a walking, talking, ursine pinup for humanising our work. So make no mistake, Paddington did not come into Britain through reg a regularised route, unlike his unfortunate forebears. Sorry, that's the only joke tonight. Um, Gary Baldy and Victor Emmanuel. Yet had Paddington, who arrived in London docks in the 1950s, and I was going to show a little bit of the film, um, Paddington, a 2014 film, where, where it shows him sort of scampering out of the ship um, as an illegal immigrant. But had he come just half a century earlier, um, as we saw yesterday, he would have had no need to enter as an illegal immigrant though he may too have faced the indignity of being auctioned off unless the Browns had come to his rescue. Now, there's, there's something that I won't be exploring, but I think it's for... I am increasingly interested in this sort of uh, animalisation, for, um, uh, both uh, romanticised, as in the case of Paddington, but also demonised in the case of, of other migrants, um, which I think is a, an, an important aspect of how minorities are represented and treated. I will start tonight with Mandate Palestine and what was a key space and time in developing the concept of the illegal immigrant. So we saw it developing yesterday, but not quite um, uh, in concrete form. Indeed, what was innovative during and immediately after the Nazi era was a type of location where the struggles over migrant restriction took place. It's been suggested by the political theorist Matthew Gibney that in the 21st century, the implementation of immigration controls has shifted in location. And he says, the traditional view of entrance as something operated at the state's borders, train stations and airports by domestic immigration officials. So we refer to the 12 or so set up in 1905 in Britain, 
This now um, increasingly appears quaint and outdated. It says it's now beyond the boundaries of the state on the high seas in foreign countries or in vaguely defined territories that exclusion from admission occurs. And I'll conclude tonight with an examination of the often catastrophic journeys that, um, in another term, irregular migrants are taking across the oceans in the 21st century. But what Gibney calls new places of control can be identified much earlier. And I suppose one of the things I've been trying to do in terms of migration and refugee studies is show that you know, history does actually have a lot to offer us uh, in showing things had earlier origins uh, and to add to the complexity of them. And in this case, they were created and employed by the British Palestinian authorities throughout the Nazi era and then immediately after it when dealing first with Jewish refugees and then survivors of the Holocaust and those categories became blurred in the Second World War itself. Ironically, they were largely implement implemented in a locus now infamous for tragic migrant journeys, <coughs> excuse me, the Mediterranean. As will become apparent, those attacked can attempt to diminish the force of negative naming by creating their own counter-process. Yesterday I used Judith Butler's work on the damaging force of hate speech. But whilst Butler acknowledges that to be named by another is traumatic, she also emphasises how that trauma constitutes a strange kind of resource. It is an act, she says, that brings me into a linguistic world in which I might then begin to exercise agency, which leaves the future partially open. And this is certainly the case with Jewish migration to Mandate Palestine. Stalia Offer, one of the major historians of this movement, has argued the variety of names given to illegal Aliyah, immigration to Palestine, reflect its many facets. From a, the Zionist perspective, these included, she says, Hapala, connoting, um, connoting surmounting obstacles to reach the high ground. Uh, Aliyah Bet, Class B immigration, as opposed to Class A, which was approved by the Palestinian <coughs> authorities to designate an underground operation, an independent or special, special Aliyah, terms used to emphasise the positive validity of Jewish immigration to Palestine. Others challenged official discourse by referring to so-called illegal immigration. Yet for those Jews attempting to reach Palestine during and after the Nazi era, the balance of forces has to be kept in mind. As offer concludes, there was one final term to describe potential migrants to Palestine, illegal immigration, the preferred British designation. Sorry, I just called to mind. I gave a lecture, first lecture on a course on Anne Frank uh, last year in a very large lecture theatre in Southampton. And as happens with most courses on the Holocaust, it's very, very gendered. Um, and there were 30 female students, two male students, one male student who was a very big bloke, three quarters way through the lecture, said to, to me, this isn't physics, is it? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> right, some quantum equations for you. <laughs> so Palestine and Jewish refugees, the 1930s. The attempt of Jewish refugees to reach Palestine by sea before September 39 the story when compounded with those who tried to enter during and after the Second World War, which has gained mythical importance in the state of Israel and across the Jewish diaspora. The narrative constructed empowers agency and heroiz heroism upon those, <coughs> excuse me, um, those that both undertook and organized these emotionally driven and increasingly desperate life-saving journeys. <coughs> Inevitably also cast those that oppose them whether the local Arab population or the British mandatory government, as the villains of the peace. There is little space left for ambiguity. The reality, however, is that the Jewish movement <coughs> to Palestine during the 1930s was complicated by the origins of the migrants and the response of the British authorities and local population to them. And as early as 1933, the politics of naming that migration was itself becoming a site of contestation. 1920, as part of its new mandatory powers bestowed upon it by the San Remo Conference, the British authorities instituted the first immigration ordinance for Palestine, 
modeled on earlier alien legislation in Britain and from, that, uh, and, and from the American earlier attempts at control. So we see now sort of controls spreading from border to border, but also into empires. Uh, and it confirms Butler's analysis uh, that with the naming, sedimentation and repetition of its usages gives it force, um, but it, it's very repetitive in terms of, of, say, British alien policy, but also American. It prohibited the entry of lunatics, uh, never, of course, defined, those rejected on medical grounds more generally, and criminals. It was supplemented by a separate agreement that was made for those whose application was supported by their Zionos, Zionist organisation up to an agreed number. They could receive visas from British consular officers throughout the world. For these Jewish immigrants, possession of capital or the prospect of employment was the key to the numbers to be let in. The Zionist organisation and later the Jewish agency was responsible for the maintenance of those it had approved. The hope was that those coming into Palestine would be productive immigrants in what was in, in effect part of the British Empire and run by the colonial office. The needs of the country, as defined by the British authorities, was paramount in determining who would be allowed entry. In 1934, for example, Arthur Woshop, the High Commissioner for Palestine, was asked by the leader of the Jewish agency for fresh permits to be granted, and he responded, by what ways could you make me feel assured that these would be the type of labour we want most and at the same time most likely to be permanently absorbed? So again, a very sort of familiar uh, discourse for immigration control in Britain, absorption and unusefulness and, and not the need of those coming in. The 1920 immigration ordinance was produced in a moment of optimism by the British authorities in Palestine as the interwar period progressed, <coughs> conflicting forces, local labour needs, Arab responses, world Jewish opinion, and the Jewish need for new opportunities and asylum would increasingly reveal the fragility of the situation. A managed immigration policy at the will of volatile economic and political considerations was bound to be messy, inconsistent, and subject to rapid change. With Arab unease about the levels of Jewish immigration to Palestine to con continuing to grow uh, in the early 1930s from, from the um, quite strong protests in the late 20s, an attempt was made in November 1933 to tighten up procedures, especially for those without permits to work. The number of people affected was small, but it's revealing that the terminology to describe those whose paperwork was not in order remained uncertain. Naming of them was now becoming uh, a problem. In late 1933, the High Commissioner for Palestine emphasised how few were being affected, so he was defending the policy. <coughs> he also used a variety, or they used a variety of terms to describe those who were being pursued, including, I quote, illegitimate immigrants, illegal settlers, and people engaged in illicit settlements. There was also some use of the phrase illegal immigrants, but this tended to focus, and I quote, on individuals illegally crossing the frontier and on tourists entering the country and remaining illegally there. Zionist leader Selik Brodetsky uh, preferred the term unauthorised settlement, so it's, it's being disputed and, and re retitled all the time. Nevertheless, the rhetorical device of linking illegality to immigration had been established. With increased Jewish migration to Palestine from Germany, but more significantly from Eastern Europe and Iraq, and growing animosity from Palestinian Arabs, usage, usage of the term would intensify and develop an incre increasingly conspiratorial tone. The words illegal and immigrant were now being put together regularly. By 1935, Jewish immigration to Palestine was again con causing concern to the British colonial authorities, and Jewish illegal immigration had become bureaucratically standardised with capitalisation, so capital J, capital I, capital I, to ensure the firmness and certainty of this new label. It was also now regarded as, as organised traffic rather than the spontaneous movement of individuals. 
Detention pending deportation was used as deterrence. By the middle to late 1930s, attempts were being made by Zionist bodies to organise Jewish immigration to Palestine outside the quota system. Yet rather than ad hoc responses to the increasing marginality of Jews in Eastern and Central Europe, colonial office officials were convinced that it was something more sinister <coughs> relating to the power rather than the powerlessness of the Jewish world. In summer 1939, the Colonial Office produced an extensive departmental paper on <coughs> illegal Jewish immigration. It was prompted to do so by hostile press coverage, especially in America, of the Palestinian authorities and its treatment of those trying to reach its shores by boat, and more generally in relation to the British government's 1939 white paper, which set infamously a maximum of 75,000 Jewish immig immigrants over the next five years. The Colonial Office was deeply concerned about the British government's perspective, that the British government's perspective was being derided by, as inhumane by the outside world, and as often affects uh, refugee policy, what one factor mitigating it is often that fear of appearing mean-spirited. To counter it, the Colonial Office emphasised that an intensive campaign, campaign of attempted illegal immigration into Palestine is now underway. <coughs> These people are knowingly trying to evade the law of Palestine. The 1939 Colonial Office paper set the template for what would be an even more intensive performative struggle over the rights and wrongs of immigration policy in Palestine during the war and after. Like many defending immigration controls, emphasis was placed on the interests of the inhabitants as against the entry of myriads of immigrants who would, unless stopped, I quote, flood the country indiscriminately through mass invasion. The control of illegal immigration was especially necessary in Palestine, which Colonial Office says was only about the size of a small county in New York State. Against this reality, the idea is fostered by Jewish circles that they are justifying, justified in trying to break the law by virtue of some super legal higher morality. So it's a sort of battle over, over morality and, and appearing to do the right thing. Jews did this by citing the persecutions in Greater Germany and the desperate plight in which many European Jews now found, find themselves. <coughs> but playing into a Semitic discourse of selfishness, criminality and insularity, the colonial office highlighted how Jews were, and I quote, thinking only of themselves and fail, fail to realise that what they are doing is fundamentally antisocial. It continued that it was in fact as antisocial as the German persecution of which they complain. Indeed, it was argued the colonial, by the Colonial Office uh, that it was necessary to be clear about one thing. This illegal immigration traffic is a dirty, sort, sordid, crooked business. So we saw that um, from 1920s in America, 1900s um, in Britain, and now it's being used as a discourse in the late 1930s. <coughs> to act as a deterrent and to diffuse tension in Palestine, the Colonial Office also explored the possibility of implementing a policy of disposal of illegal immigrants. The Secretary of State mooted the idea of finding an island or other suitable place where they could be maintained temporarily pending their absor absorption as refugee settlers elsewhere. So just to summarise in terms of numbers, in 1938 and 39, some 40,000 Jews reached Palestine, just over 17,000 of whom, it's been estimated, were categorised as illegal. So moving on to the Second World War. With the outbreak of war and the fast deteriorating situation of European Jewry, the discourse of the colonial office on illegal immigration <coughs> not only persisted, but intensified in its animosity. Indeed, the conflict allowed ever more conspiratorial aspects to develop. The belief that the Nazis were encouraging such migration to cause maximum damage and embarrassment to the British and the Arab world was given fresh impetus. It was thus suggested that there were Nazi agents among the Jews who were now not only illegal, but also enemy aliens and fifth columnists. Increasing emphasis was thus placed on deterrence, but rather than detention in Palestine, Officials believed that using other territories, especially within the British um, Empire, could be employed, the more unattractive the better. 
Infamous cases of the Patria and the Struma reflect how the impulse behind this option could tragically be put into practice. Although there was a flurry of illegal immigration to Palestine in the first months of war, the flow slowed down by summer 1940, only to pick up again in the autumn. Inevitably, the journeys on increasingly unsafe vessels in time of total war became more and more dangerous and the conditions appalling. Two, sh two such ships, the Milos and the Pacific, arrived early in November 1940, carrying around 1,800 Jews from Greater Germany between them. Sticking to the deterrent, uh, deterrent punishment plan, the decision was made to transfer them to the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean on a larger vessel, vessel the Patria. A third disabled ship, the, the Atlantic, in which seven of its passengers had died of typer, typhus, was towed by the British Navy into Cyprus, and from there, under British naval escort, set off for Haifa. On arrival, transfer of its passengers to the Patria began, but was largely incomplete before disaster struck. Some in the Jewish defense world, the Haganah, Haganah, wanted a decisive response, and on the 25th of November 1940, a bomb that had been planted earlier was detonated with the intention of immobilizing the Patria. The planned explosion led to calamity. The ship sank rapidly. Roughly 200 immigrants out of the 1900 on board and 50 British crew drowned. After the explosion, the British cabinet decided not to deport the survivors of the ship to Mauritius. This justified as a special act of clemency. This was not, however, a recognition of their persecution in Europe but having, I quote, regard to their suffering, the sufferings which these immigrants had undergone in the Patria. This clemency did not extend to the passengers on board the Atlantic who had avoided being, avoided being transferred. Instead, they were deported to Mauritius for the remainder of the war. So again, um, this idea of, of remote sort of control, remote um, settlement has a long history. The ending of Nazi emigration policy towards the Jews in autumn 1941 moved towards the final solution. Alongside restricted routes of escape, inevitably limited the number of Jews able to reach the shores of Palestine. <coughs> the cases of the Salvador and the Struma reflected this harsh <coughs> reality for European Jewry. The Salvador carried around 350 Jews, mainly from Bulgaria, and it set off from Varna in December 1940. And so in Seaworthy, it was wrecked not long into its journey, with over 200 of the passengers drowned, among them 70 children. The head of the Foreign Office refugee section in Whitehall, in response to news of its sinking, noted that, and I quote, there could be, have been no more opportune disaster from the point of view of stopping this traffic. Deterrence was still the main strategy of control, and similar comments have been made over the last few years, when there's been disasters at sea of the hope that that will stop other people trying. A month later, the Foreign Office heard reports that another ship carrying illegal Im immigrants was due to leave Varna. <coughs> in a telegram to its representative, representative in Sofia, it noted that the SS Struma is due to leave with 500 Jews for Palestine. Blaming the Bulgarian authorities for the terrible loss of life on the Salvador, it recommended that if the Struma is overcrowded and has an insufficient life-saving apparatus, apparatus, you should refer Bulgarians to relevant articles of international convention for the safety of life at sea. A year later, the same ship, in reality an ancient converted yacht, embarked on a fresh journey that was to end in an even greater tragedy at sea. The Struma left Constanza in December 1941 with 769 Jewish refugees on board, victims of rapidly escalating Romanian state persecution. When it arrived in Turkish waters, Randall, head of the Foreign Office's refugee department, perceived what he said was a terrible dilemma. And he outlined it. If the Turks send the refugees back to the Black Sea, they may be wrecked, <coughs> or in any case will presumably go back to the very hard conditions in whichever part of German control Europe they have come from. If, however, they are sent on to Palestine, they will be an impossible burden for the High Commissioner. Randall added that the refugees may also be a means of introducing enemy <coughs> aliens, <coughs> and that allowing them in would encourage further movements. 
For the rest of the war, from the British perspective, the only solution was to combat such movements through diplomatic, security and ultimately military means. In the discourse of illegality, racketeering and false morality, having shown itself to be so flexible and persistent, proved to have an even longer performative life beyond 1945, so the post-war era. The last journey of the President Warfield, renamed Exodus 1947, when it was transformed into one of the largest ships transporting illegal immigrants to Palestine during the last years of the British Mandate, has become a central plank in constructing the mythological origins of the State of Israel. In the words of Israeli novelist Yoram Kanyak, after Exodus came the War of Independence, the first chapter ended and a new chapter began. On a, at a mundane level, this ship was one of many over 60 carrying illegal immigrants attempting to reach Palestine from August 45 to May 48. Slow to pick up after the war, it was part of the rapid increase in such migration during the two following years, 23,000 in 46, 29,000 in 47. And in, indeed, over half clandestine or illegal immigrants arrived in Palestine in the, in the years between 46 and 48, so this is when it's most concentrated. Articulating the Zionist reading of the ship's wider significance, Mordechai Naor notes how over 100 ships reached the shores of Palestine during the years of organised clandestine immigration, but none was as famous as Exodus 1947. <coughs> it exemplified the struggle of the immigrants and the Yishuv for, for free immigration. British obstin obstinacy, he adds, and indifference to the Holocaust survivors also reached its peak in the story of the Exodus. President Warfield, or Exodus 1947, having left France in July 1947 with over 4,500 Jews on board, was confronted by the British Navy as it moved towards Palestine, leaving three dead and the ship damaged. The ship was then escorted to Haifa under British control. At Haifa, most of those on board were transferred by the British authorities to three other ships, the Runnymede Park, Ocean Vigor and Empire Rival, and returned to Europe. From an extended stay in France, where the vast majority of the refugees refused to accept an offer of asylum, the ships moved on to Hamburg, where they arrived in September 1947. Following a minor struggle, the 4,000 Jews on board disembarked. Sent to two refugee camps, the Exodus 1947 refugees were given privileged status by the Zionist movement and were surreptitiously sent to Palestine as special immigrants. Such a performative act was in final defiance of the British authorities over this notorious episode. There were many such confrontations between the British authorities and illegal Jewish immigrants in the immediate post-war period. The island of Cyprus became a holding camp for the thousands who were caught attempting to reach the shores of Palestine. Yet both at the time and subsequently, the journey of the Exodus 1947 was given special attention. After it left France, Ambassador Duff Cooper in Paris told the French Foreign Minister that the British government, I quote, intended to make an example of this ship. But for Zionists, it was according to the journalist Ruth Gruber, one of its most famous chroniclers, um, the ship that launched a nation. As Irvin Birnbaum, a passenger, articulated, uh, and again in sort of mythological fashion, it shows that we cannot depend on anybody but ourselves. We had only one place to go, and that place was, and still is, Israel. <coughs> we cannot go to the moon, and no other country wants us. In the late 1950s and 60s, Leon Uris's best-selling book and later film of Exodus revealed a deep American uh, attach, uh, identification with this journey. So it, it's, again, it, it sort of has a transnational history, not in Britain, but, but, but in America. Uh, in Israel, identification with Exodus 1947, not surprisingly, has been even more intense. With the need to emphasize Jewish agency in the formation of the state, the organization of illegal immigration played and continues to play a key role in Israeli mythology as a foundation story, sto <coughs> story of the nation. It's been contested by rival Zionist factions, uh, of which role was mo more important, as well as the leaders of the ships, anxious that their role 
uh, in the story was not lost or mar marginalised. And it's been said that no sooner had the immigrants landed in Germany <coughs> than the various parties and movements set to writing down the history of the Exodus affair to ensure their part in the glory. On board the ship, the passengers confronted their naming as illegal by asserting their own identity and agency, and this takes us back to Butler. The leaders told them that you are already citizens of Eretz Israel, wherever, whatever the English they, and they were presented with blue certificates present, uh, printed in Hebrew on one side on English on the other, entitled, A Permit to Enter Palestine. Aviva Halamish, has, in her study of the Exodus affair, has highlighted that when the story of illegal immigration was put down in writing <coughs> in the first decades of the Jewish state, the immigrants themselves all but disappeared. This top-down approach was apparent even on board the uh, President Warfield with regard to the renaming of the ship. Several days after its initial departure from France, uh, Haganah organisers in France agreed that it was to be known as Exodus 1947. The commander of the, of the ship, Yossi Harrell, was informed of this decision. This dramatic renaming was not, however, com communicated to the passengers who had come up with alternatives. The American crew members were keen on Roosevelt, possibly more uh, for Eleanor th than Franklin. Some passengers preferred, um, to, uh, preferred Mordechai Anilovitz, one of the lead, lead, very young leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in April 1943, and, and coming from a sort of more Bundist background. These were ignored, but it was not until the ship came into conflict with the British Navy that the new name was unveiled, and it sailed into Haifa with a large banner to a centre, that declaring that she was Haganah ship Exodus 1947. Thereafter, so great was the aura associated with this journey that all three ships returning to Europe with the former President Warfield passengers became collectively known in the Zionist world and beyond as Exodus 1947. This process of naming and renaming further added to the ship's mythology. Indeed, the issue of naming was such that the British government was forced in vain to insist on the original appellation of the ships, especially the President Warfield. In subsequent memory, the specifics of the particular journeys of the four ships, collectively known as Exodus 1940, would matter, 47 would matter less. Uh, it's been said that Leon Uris's loose grasp of history and his melding and confusing of naming was the only the most blatant and influ influential example of this process. It's perhaps not surprising, therefore, that the actual ship, the President Warfield, was left to rot in Haifa, where it remained abandoned. <coughs> It was accidentally set in on fire in 1952 and disappeared beneath the waves, it's said, like so much discarded rubbish, resting on the seaboard bed outside the port. Nevertheless, its journey and that of the other 60-plus illegal Haganah ships feature prominently in the clandestine Immigration and Naval Museum um, in Haifa, and I think this is the only surviving um, ship from the post-war period. Historians now dispute uh, the centrality of illegal immigration in the power politics of late mandate Palestine <coughs> and the eventual formation of a Jewish state. So that's the sort of, at, if you like, at the level of real power. Yet at the level of popular mythology in Israel and the wider Jew Jewish diaspora and in the American non-Jewish world, these journeys, and especially that of Exodus 1947, still play a self-affirming and comforting role. So self, so. Ironically, in this period, outside the British world, illegal immigrant becomes a rescued term uh, and a sort of a, a valued label. Uh, there is thus an attempt at continuity in stressing Jewish self-determination in the clandestine immigration and naval museum with the Haganah-led ships of 46 and 47 <coughs> melding into that of the Israeli Navy. In addition, part uh, of the Patria, which I mentioned just before, has subsequently been salvaged and on display there, again utilised performatively as a symbol of Jewish self-determination and outside hostility or indifference. In the dominant Israeli narrative, Jewish isolation during the Holocaust and the antipathy towards its survivors, as typified by the treatment of illegal immigrants by the British authorities, largely precludes 
consideration of other migrant journeys. So that one of the themes of these lectures has been how certain groups are, are validated and others not. Uh, and in this case, in that dominant Israeli narrative, that of the Palestinians in 1947 and 48 is, is removed. Whilst the figures are disputed, roughly three quarters of a million Palestinians left or were forced out of their homes <coughs> in the last months of the British mandate and the creation of the Israeli state. There are few either in the Israeli or Palestinian worlds <coughs> who are able to consider the recent or ongoing homelessness of each other's experiences. The words and actions of Elie Bizel inform my Bogdanov lectures, as, as we saw yesterday, and I'll end with him today. Uh, they sort of bookend, uh, are bookended by him, but it remains that, that the plight of the displaced Palestinian refugees was a blind spot for this great humanitarian. Politics and suspicion have acted as a barrier between Jewish and pal Palestinian mutual awareness of and sensitivity to refugeedom in past and present. As Bashir Bashir and Amos Goldberg suggest, this, not need, this need not necessarily be the case. They argue that the Palestinian and Jewish refugees of the Nakba and the Holocaust not only serve as disruptive and alarming reminders of exclusionary forces of identity politics in Israel-Palestine, Pal more positively they are, I quote, also a challenge to the status mainstream Palestinian and Israeli politics that view exclusive and separate ethnic nation, nation states as the ultimate and desired institutional frame within which, which the political rights of the respective peoples are realized and protected. From this inclusive, if idealist perspective, they suggest that consequently, one could view the refugee as a herald of alternative and created forms of politics one's premised on partnership, cooperation, joint dwelling and integration, rather than segregation, balkanization, separation and ghettoization. If making such linkages, however desirable, seems unlikely given the dismal politics of the contemporary Middle East, it is hard to envisage the Exodus 1947 story being placed alongside more recent narratives of forced migrations across the merciless sea. So far, the exclusive tendencies and partial, partial amnesia associated with its journeying have largely precluded such comparisons. But in the spirit of the, of the challenge and opportunity offered by Bashir and Goldberg, the final part of, of my lecture will explore the possibilities further. So the last section, performing Lampedusa. It's been estimated that from 1933 to 1948, over 100,000 Jewish illegal immigrants came to Palestine in 116 vessels. In 2014 alone, double that number of undocumented migrants came to Europe by sea, thousands drowning in the Mediterranean attempting to do so. In 2015, these numbers were quadrupled. In her human cargo, um, on 21st century migra migrants, Caroline Moorhead defines an illegal immigrant as a person residing in a foreign country without permission. As a narrative progresses, Moorhead returns to that definition. She interrogates it especially in relation to the Australian homeland of her father, Alan. Their boat people, regardless of their status, were labelled by the Liberal government during the 1990s as illegals. Um, and I mentioned yesterday sort of the, the shorthand form, and, and I think Australia has been at the forefront alongside America in that abbreviation. So illegal immigrants becomes, or aliens becomes, just illegals. For Moorhead, the use of the word illegal suggests criminals, people who have done wrong, terrorists, certainly people not entitled to anything. <coughs> they are seen as queue jumpers, stealing the places of the good refugees who have been patiently waiting their turn. Moorhead's human cargo was an important intervention into debates about world asylum seekers, which has grown increasingly animated in the first decades of the 21st century. By the time of, of her book's publication in 2005, the island of Lampedusa had become infamous in this respect, a notoriety that has grown exponentially in the subsequent uh, 15, 14 years. And, and Lampedusa, again, has been very much in the news, particularly with the um, 
fortunately now disappeared, right-wing Italian government, which refused um, several boats, uh, rescue boats, to, to, to actually dock in its small harbour. Lampedusa, as Moorhead poetically suggests, is where Italy ends and where Africa begins. It is a small, sparsely um, populated and bare island, ominously with regard to its later function as a reception than detention centre for migrants uh, in this la la last century, in the uh, late 20th and early 21st century. It had a prehistory, serving as a penal colony in, uh, during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Moorhead described Lampedusa in the first years of the new century. Spring and summer on the long, calm days, it is where the refugees arrive almost daily in their battered and crumbling boats, frightened, unsure, expectant. More clinically, she added, that experts in asylum matters who study the flow of refugees and their journeys to the north call it the blue route after the waters of the Mediterranean. Since then, it could be argued, though the, the Greek islands um, briefly overtook it, no place has come to symbolize the intense human tragedy and drama of modern migration, evoking sentiments of pity, shame and fear in equal measures, and no more so in 2019. Politicians, NGOs, media, the islanders and migrants themselves have confronted and represented the recent and ongoing story of Lampedusa. And as with Palestine and illegal immigration, questions of performativity have been central in establishing meaning to Lampedusa. In 2015, TripAdvisor produced a list of the top 10 beaches in Europe. The first three were in the Mediterranean, with Rabbit Beach Lampedusa ranked the highest. As is happening in other parts of the Blue Route, including the Greek islands, the misery of migration at its most desperate is coinciding in time and place with the pursuit of tourist pleasure. Affl affluent Western visitors are thus witnessing the victims of dictatorship, failed state, civil war, ethnic cleansing, religious intolerance and basic deprival of life chances. They are thus inadvertently becoming co-presents to those suffering the most extreme problems of this century. There are no definitive figures for those who have died, who have died migrating to Europe using the Mediterranean. Using um, media and NGOs, the monitoring group Fortress Europe argued that between 93 and 2011, close to 20,000 died en route. Um, and that, that figure is now estimated from the 1890s to today at about 40,000. Due to stringent control in North Africa, uh, recently imposed by the West, the numbers using the Mediterranean route have declined, but relatively the death rate has intensified as journeys become more desperate and exploitative, and those <coughs> um, boats set up to, to, to rescue the migrants have, have become uh, sort of illegalized themselves. Even now, many disappear simply without trace. The problem of using existing data and reportage is, is that, as has been argued, some places receive more attention than others because they have developed into border, border theatres. And of all these, Lampedusa is the most prominent example. Without its connection to boat migrants, it's been said Lampedusa would just be one of the many minor Italian islands living on fishing and tourism. Its recent con connection to migration began slowly and then transformed the island. At times since the 21st century, migrants have outnumbered residents, so just under 6,000 residents, and an infrastructure involving large-scale policing uh, and an army presence, and humanitarian um, presence has also impacted on, uh, on its everyday life. I think it's fair to say that the, sort of the small number of, of, of people from Lampedusa are getting very fed up of, sort of these visitors and presences. It's often assumed that desperate migrants have chosen to come to Lampedusa as the closest uh, piece of European land from, from Africa. Uh, whilst in the early stage of this movement in the 1990s, there was an element of truth in such assumptions. <coughs> it's not been the case subsequently. Since the early 21st century, 
It has been emphasised that migrants did not arrive of their own accord. They did, they did not thus choose Lampedusa, but were directed and diverted there by the Italian authorities as a way of controlling the flows of migration, which were both increasing in numbers and diversifying in places of origin. In 2013, for example, close to 15,000 migrants were processed through Lampedusa, most at that point fleeing from Eritrea. The numbers in the early 1990s were much smaller, but in 1996 they merited the construction of an informal reception centre, largely run by local volunteers. Two years later, reflecting the growing anxiety about such migration, this voluntary centre was replaced by an official one near the airport. It accommodated up to 150 people and was surrounded by barbed wire. Inmates were forbidden from moving around freely around the island. Uh, and then they were from there they were distributed by plane to other facilities in Sicily um, or deported to Libya. In, to in turn, a new detention centre was constructed which opened in 2007, designed for up to 800 internees. And this was a, a demonstration, well, as you can see, more than a demonstration um, by, I think, Algerian uh, people detained there about um, their inability to, to sort of claim asylum or, and, the, and the facilities. Lampedusa has become what we call a border zone, a place which has essentially become detached from the rest of Italy. It is, in the words of Alison Mons, one of many stateless spaces, and we see those in outside Australia as well, which takes us back to, to um, Caroline Moorhead's work, places like Christmas Island. The Sicilian Channel had in effect become an outer border of the European uni Union, and Lampedusa was the focal place or non-place where attempts were, were made at controlling the flow <coughs> of unwanted illegal migrants. Then on the 3rd of October 2013, the world witnessed the most dramatic human disaster in the Mediterranean Sea since the Second World War. A small fishing boat that had, been, had left Libya carrying over 500 largely Somalian and Eritrean refugees caught fire half a mile from Ram Lampedusa. Only 155 survived, with the rest drowning. What happened on, on that night was a day was far from the first instance of mass migrant death at sea and it's been surpassed by even greater tragedies thereafter. The response to it, however, marked a rupture. Its scale, it's been suggested, was too great for us to ignore. The disaster led to an international outcry led by the Pope who visited the island where both the survivors and the bodies of some of the dead had been brought. Pope Francis, in what was his first official visit, responded that the word disgrace comes to mind. It is a disgrace. He also urged, let's unite our efforts so that tragedies like this don't happen again. Whilst in 2014, um, some uh, 170,000 migrants were rescued in the Mediterranean, less than 18 months after third, uh, of October 2013, several small <coughs> similar boats capsized close to Lampedusa, with over 300 migrants feared to have drowned. These, however, were overshadowed by an even larger catastrophe in the spring of 2015. A boat carrying over 800 migrants sank, leaving just 28 survivors. Up to half a million migrants attempted this dangerous journey by land and then sea from Africa to Europe in 2015 alone. And whilst the overall number of boat migrants has decreased since 2016, um, those going different forms of the Blue Route have grown until the last two years, as has deaths at, at, at sea. There is a parallel in Lampedusa to Exodus 1947, which the British and Palestinian authorities wanted to make into a salutary example, as well as a specific case of refused entry to illegal immigrants. In both cases, security and economic fears have run alongside humanitarian concern. In the case of the Jewish illegal immigration, the British tried and failed to impress the world that those embarking on such journeys, and especially the organisers, were doing so at the expense of genuine, legitimate refugees. Today, similar dynamics are at work, with the focus of European bodies and politicians being on the criminal smugglers 
and a, um, a criminal inverted commas, and the need to curtail their activities, including the destruction of boats used to, to carry the migrants. If those used uh, to transport Jewish migrants in and after the Nazi era were larger vessels well beyond their useful life, many of those today are tiny. It's been said that they like ones children used to play with on the beach. They're really just toys. It's been noted of the uh, 40 to 50,000 migrant deaths in transit recorded, and perhaps as many as two thirds are not. For as many as one in five, um, the region, let alone the country of origin, is unknown. That so many deaths literally leave no trace in a world of instant communication and constant surveillance reflects the upper, utter obscurity and marginality of so many migrants today. And again, the, the naming goes alongside that. The Mediterranean, for example, has been described as the busiest ocean in the world, yet thousands have drowned in it. Against that invisibility is the desire of many NGOs, journalists, campaigners, academics and others uh, to restore individuality to the migrants. Yet EU regulations force migrants into certain narratives in order to gain entrance. Perhaps the most desperate attempt to perform refugeedom is the desire to show innocence through the presence of young children on these boats. Abdul Azizi and 26 other refugees from Afghanistan and Syria boarded a boat from Turkey aiming for Greece. <coughs> After two hours, their engine failed and a Greek Coast Guard vessel ordered them to return to Turkey. We said, he sa uh, Abdul said, we said the boat had broken down and we took the babies and held them above our heads to show that the we there were children on board, but they didn't listen. Their boat was towed towards Turkey and then began to sink. He says the women and children were in the hold and we went to try and get them. Everything happened so quickly. There was no time to save our children. We had arrived in Europe. We were refugees, but in a flash I had lost my child and my wife. The 300 plus victims of the October 2013 Lampedusa disaster, which, which prompted the Pope's visit, included a baby boy still attached to his mother by the umbilical cord. After 1945, Jewish survivors of the Holocaust performed their persecuted state through adopting, and this is the, the phrase of the British authorities, what, what this British official called, um, an MI5 official I should say, a Belson pose. In the first decades of the 21st century, the climate of distrust is such that migrants are forced to exhibit their children to show that they are not a, a threat to the receiving countries. And I should add that no children under 12 reached Lampedusa alive following the 3rd of October 2013 tragedy. In the detention centres, centre of the island and its everyday life, the migrants have, been, been, have both resisted and formed some alliances <coughs> with the local uh, inhabitants. In February 2014, this led to the creation of the Charter of Lampedusa, uh, which was not intended as a draft law, but an expression of an alternative vision, where, I quote, differences must be considered as asset, assets, a source of new opportunities, and must never be exploited to build barriers. Lampedusa has also acted as a source of identity for those who have found asylum beyond its shores. It has led to groups including Lampedusa in Berlin and many other cities in Germany and, and Sweden using the solidarity of this experience to campaign for better treatment of migrants at all stages of the journey. Those migrants who have passed through the island have made a determined effort at self-representation, including in the form of heritage performance. An alternative museum and archive of Lampedusa has been created on the island itself, uh, organized by anarchists and with a wonderful inability to decide when they open. Um, it's, it's sort of the popular front of tooting, uh, but in Lampedusa. Made up of the ruined boats and lost belongings of the migrants and through an on online archive, including the creation of a powerful film to whom it may concern, which I'd recommend, which is on, on YouTube. If Exodus 1947 was performed both at the time and subsequently as an epic narrative, it is already clear that Lampedusa has become part of a global story, one in which the migrants themselves are playing a significant role in constructing its past, its present and future memory. 
So to conclude, the island of Lampedusa has been a military base for various empires and it's continued this fortress role as a border for the European Union. It's also been a place of local welcome to newcomers escaping danger and a place of livelihood for fishermen and farmers. Population movements in and out of the island, forced and voluntary, are integral to its remote history, a part of and apart from Europe. The boat people and the treatment of them, including deportation and return, as well as empathy towards them, are part of a deep history and not alien to it. The politics of performativity involving both Exodus 1947 and contemporary <coughs> boat people, history matters. On one level, they share a common bureaucratic past and the construction of, inverted commas, the illegal immigrants. That there are few, if any, links made between the boat migrants of the 21st century and the illegals of the 1930s and 40s reflects largely the self-contained nature of Holocaust studies, including Jewish refugees from that era, but also and equally the ahistorical nature of forced migration studies. Exclusive readings of the past hinder the universalism proclaimed in the Charter of Lampedusa, uh, that, and I quote, as human beings, we all inhabit the earth as a shared space. It stands for global freedom for all, recognizing that the history of humanity is a history of migration, admonishing no illegalization of people. Migration is not a crime. But there is more. In the world of Trump and Brexit, it becomes normalized for migrant children to be incarcerated and even to die in captivity. And for those legally settled in Britain for decades to lose their jobs, housing, to die through refusal of medical treatment and to be taught, deported as a result of Theresa May, uh, when Home Secretary, her hostile environment towards so-called illegal immigrants. With bitter irony, this year Britain uh, agreed to create a national memorial to the Windrush generation at, at Waterloo Station on the same day that protests were being carried out against the continued deportation of those who came from the Caribbean in the post-war period. So we like our, our West Indian migrants to be cuddly with a nice brown coat um, and to live in, in uh, Primrose Hill. The illegal alien or the illegal immigrant has always been a cultural construct that has in been imposed by politicians and civil servants to keep her and the media to keep out tho those they do not want, often for reasons of racism, including anti-Semitism. In America, the slogan, what part of illegal don't you understand, has become an everyday discourse. Once a people become illegal, as Jewish history shows us, anything is possible. Yesterday I quoted Elie Wiesel, um, you who are so-called illegal aliens must know that no human being is illegal. That is a contradiction in terms. To close my Bogdanov lectures, how long have migrants been labelled illegal? The answer is historically not too long, but ethically far, far too long.